Hello, Sarah. Welcome to the show. Hello. Thank you for having me. <laughs> <laughs> this feels quite delightful, doesn't it? It surely does. Yeah, I'm looking forward to this. <laughs> I feel like I'm welcoming you to a part of my home that you've never been to before. Very true. I have interviewed you once before, but this does feel different. This does mm, feel different. It does. It wasn't here. It was actually in your home, if I remember rightly. Yes. 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 <laughs> And so, yes, very confusingly, we're turning the tables again in a different way. And you are now here in my home interviewing me um, about, uh, <laughs> it's a bit of a cliche, a topic very dear to my heart. And so I am going to just hand over to you and let you lead from here. Wow. Wow. Thank you. Okay. So this is a very juicy topic and one that I think listeners will come at from their own lens of what, what we mean. So my first question to you, Leanne, is to yeah, define what we're going to be talking about. So how would you define love in a magical sense? And its relevance to this conversation that we're going to have on this show? Mm. As, I'm, as I'm experiencing that question, I'm realizing how, how many layers I were energetic layers I was kind of dropping down into to get to the place where it's like the, the truest the truest place, my truest experience of love, which um, I think is a different place to where I'd been answering from even a week ago. That's what's really present for me. And to a very large extent, I guess, is what's, what's catalyzed us being here now talking about this. I think the whole conversation has been created um, to a large extent by the experience I had at the weekend, um, which you know, uh, listeners may or may not know, but I had a burial initiation, which I'm not going to get into the details of, but I really want to be clear. The, the experience I had in the grave is very much informing a deeper experience of the kind of love that we're going to be talking about, which is something that has been such an important part of my own path, my own experience for the last few years. But there was something I experienced in that night, which is wanting to make itself present now in this conversation. So I really want to, before I even answer your question, I really felt that that needed to be honored actually um because it really was the the gift the gift of that initiation and the kind of love that we're talking about here which we could describe as love through a magical lens we could describe it as divine love we could call it a we could say unconditional love actually, but it's beyond what we typically as humans mean when we're saying unconditional love, but it really is a, a love that welcomes and accepts and holds all things. And in doing so in the, in the, it's not even an act, but in the experience of that, Things are alchemized, things are released, things die, and things are created. And it's that last part in particular, that word created, and we touched on this just before we started recording. It's also linked so beautifully to the medicine circle you and I were both in this morning, which was to a large extent focused on eros our sexual nature, our sexual energy, 
and how when we're talking about creation, when we're talking about generating, this is such an important part of what we're talking about here, that, that, that generative, creative aspect of love and how if we aren't including that when we're talking about love, we are cutting off, we are dismissing, we're denying so much of our power, so much of the experience we came here for, so much of what's possible for us as beings who are part human and part divine. So that's what I mean when I say love. <laughs> Gorgeous. Um, what I'm hearing in your share is that, um, so that is the, that sounds like, yeah, the love that we all therefore um, should be bathing in. It's, it's what we're born or created from, born into. So why is that love not experienced in its fullness all the time then for us, by us? There's, we could have a really long conversation about trauma and conditioning, but I'm not feeling like this is the time to do so. But I guess a more, a more sort of first principles way of talking about this is that we're born into a world in which it makes sense to operate conditionally, to create separation, to experience separation, um, to know ourselves as separate. And from that place, the kind of love we're talking about here isn't even, isn't even, um, isn't, it's just not even known. It's not a choice because it's just not known. It's not experienced. What we're experiencing is at best conditional love, which is a kind of like this like diluted, tiny, like, you know, drop of the ocean that's love, a real dilution of what it really is. And of course, it's one of the most prized things on earth. You know, we'll do all sorts of things for that diluted version of it because it's that powerful, even in its most dilute form. But that, that's why we, we just haven't experienced it. And so we, that's what we know love, really, when most humans are talking about love, we're actually talking about conditional love. We're talking about... Um, a love that is based on us being disconnected from ourselves, from spirit, and therefore from each other. So if we're operating in this unconditional love and yeah, on this diluted version, this tiny amount, there must be, I know you just said you don't want to get into necessarily in this conversation trauma, but there must be a reason for that to be the case. There must be a reason that, for, um, the word that's coming to me is safety. Mm. So yeah, I'm just interested to hear a little bit more on why we would only have this diluted amount if we've got, you know, if this, creative life force love energy or whatever is is here for us then why would we only have access to this tiny amount or seemingly only have access to this diluted mm. version and this really is something that only makes sense when we zoom out and recognize that we are we're operating in a context that is disconnected. We're operating in a context that is um, traumatized. 
and that has been the case for most of us for generations and generations so it's really hard to track back to being like trauma that we've experienced personally we're, tra we're traumatized culturally um, and that's really important to recognize because whilst it can be really powerful to use our own personal wounds as a portal as you know we do do in our work it's also important to recognize all of that's happening within a context of disconnection so it's not that we're just personally disconnected we're just disconnected culturally and so from within that it it requires us to have open to some form of love beyond the personal to even for it to feel safe to be able to be in this world where people are, are walking around with this sense of self which is disconnected and by its very nature creates this kind of like almost um, a competition for everything resources love safety it, it creates this sense of we're needing to work against each other because we're not the same. And that's, um, whilst we're still in that illusion, how can we possibly see there's something beyond that? We can only see it within that, that limited bubble of separation from which, of course, like you say, the word safety is exactly right. Why on earth would it be safe to open to receive everything that's here when it's all happening within a bubble of the, here we are these separate people all who have a very personal self-focused um driven by fear motivation and again it's it's completely innocent it's because the experience of something else hasn't been had it's not known it's not even known for most at an intellectual level, certainly not at an embodied level. Okay, so why then, why does it, why does it matter? Why does it matter that, um, you know, we know that this greater love is available to us if it actually, is um it's not even safe to 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 go there why do what what i suppose my question my question is um well it's not well i suppose is it a question it's more of a um, i'd like you to help me understand why this disconnection is there That felt like a different question. That feels like the oh, same question it? you just asked, but it felt like there was a different question that you were wanting to ask. Mm. What is the other question? Hmm. Could you hear the question? Could you hear where I was going? That would be. <laughs> I think it was if it feels unsafe why would we even want to move towards this at the moment potentially abstract idea of something that doesn't feel true and certainly doesn't feel safe i think that felt to me like something like the question you're wanting to ask yes yeah yeah it's yeah it definitely it's um yeah yes please <laughs> <laughs> Yes, please. Tell me. Tell me. Well, it, it really is the Holy Grail. It really is actually what we're all seeking. And we can, we'll use all sorts of words to name that. But at the heart, it is the form of love we're talking about that will give us that and also open all the doors to all the things we desire we've come here as souls to have a particular kind of experience and it's that closing to love it's that non-acceptance of all parts of ourselves let alone what's going on out there that 
will block the experience we came here for. And it, it does require, again, because of the fact it doesn't feel safe, because it doesn't feel real, because we're going to be like, it sounds like a pipe dream, that there is something beyond um, this conditional form of love that we're all desperately wanting. It does require real courage, particularly in the early stages. There's a point where we reach a tipping point where we feel enough of again let's call it divine love for the moment we feel enough of that divine love that it it kind of creates this like self-propulsion where we just get deeper and deeper experiences of that and it's not even a question anymore whether to continue but in the early stages it really does require courage to keep moving into and this is this is really um, getting to the crux of both the challenge but also the power of this it requires us to go to the places we least want to go it requires us to look at the places in ourselves and also others that most repel us disgust us um, scare us anger us and initially it feels as though we need to bring almost like our personal love there that's 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 how it feels it's like our own personal love to those places and after a while that starts to shift as I described it feels less and less personal more and more as though we are opening to allow something greater than us to like pour through us and like with that just absolute acceptance for all parts of us but again at the early stages it is a conscious choosing into bringing love to what doesn't seem lovable and knowing that or even not knowing hoping maybe sometimes to begin with that that will be that al alchemical agent that that way that things can start to transform um and as you've seen you know as you see all the time in wake the wild crucibles that can be the hardest scariest thing on earth people will and that's even when it's not love necessarily they're yet ready to bring themselves that can be love that i'm bringing to those parts of them it, it can be weirdly in a way it almost doesn't make sense that can be weirdly uh repulsive weirdly like i just can't be with this it's not safe and so it's the, there's every reason in the world to go here, but there's also every reason in the world why it's, why it's going to be really challenging. Yeah, so much was coming up when you were sharing that then. So firstly, what was coming up was um, just all of the, the times that um, myself and, and I suspect uh, a lot of people have have tried to open and then been it's you've been rejected in in some way. Mm. Um, um, you know, I was thinking of first times in school and things like that. Then I was like jumping to uh, being in the office, and there's just so many examples of when we dare to open and then it's it's met with some sort of um hostility rejection mm. whatever and then um yeah it, it like you say i think you mentioned the word courageous because it, to just to continue to open as opposed to armor up shut down is yeah is <laughs> is tricky but then mm. when you just added that last bit about but then when you actually are met with unconditional love that that also feels scary and that i can't let that in can't let that in either so um firstly i'd just like to ask about the um the, the opening to love and 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 how we deal with um that the rejection like it just feels like too much for our nervous system to handle 
Um, so I'm just curious as to how, how, on, how on earth can we bring love and be open when it's, yeah, it, it feels danger, it's dangerous. It feels absolutely, mm. yeah, terrifying. And of course, I'm saying everything I'm saying from the basis of there needs to be real discernment brought to the places that we open. Right. And mm -hmm. I wouldn't say, you know, override. Ultimately, fear is going to rise, whether it's the right place or not. Recognize that. So we can have all of this fear arising either because it's it's um the correct response as in it's the right response because the environment actually isn't safe or and most of the time this is the case because it's old wounding creating that and so if we look there for the answer is this safe we're going to get the the response back like of course it's not safe of course it's not safe so it's um it's really important to recognize that and allow ourselves to be guided and you know this is the work in itself to learn to be guided by something deeper more and more as we as we do the work of creating that relationship with whether we can call it a soul a higher self will the more and more we're able to be guided from there we are able then to hold ourselves through experiences to make choices that still are bringing up fear and yet we know they're aligned and you know that that would be a whole conversation in itself to be able to be navigated from that place but ultimately that's the place to make these choices like where to open it needs to come from that deep sense of alignment even if there's fear present um <clears throat> So with that said, assuming again, it is an aligned place to be in that work of opening and recognize like, yes, there is that being honoring and gentle of your nervous system. It's not going to be wise to just completely fry yourself. So there is just no way you can even function. And the only way to move into the expansion that's required is to do that kind of like titration really you know like a drop of what's needed here recognize the effect that's having on your system do what's needed to integrate that before you open to receive more and that could obviously look like all sorts of things but really at a first principles level that's what i'm talking about really recognize the interplay of like okay there's fear present and i can feel this is aligned okay i can have a little bit of it not too much because otherwise i'm just going to be you know spending god knows how long just trying to deal with the effects of that so this is you know real stuff it can sound when we're when we're having a conversation in this moment feeling great perfectly safe it is hard to remember like how visceral that experience of fear is how real it looks that we're not just going to get rejected but we're going to get rejected and die. Like that's the experience it feels like so, so visceral, so tangible. So none of what I'm saying, I'm saying from this kind of get over yourself place or minimizing it or speaking about it as if it's kind of like only exists at principle level. These are real experiences we have as humans that absolutely get in the way of us being able to live open, live as the divine expression we came here to be. And so none of what I'm saying is dismissing that at all. It's including it. It's part of the path. It's part of the work. It's where we need to bring the love, ironically. Okay, so I'm hearing that um, we can, as humans, live in, in a way that is, yeah, both divine and human at the same time. Is that what you're saying is possible mm -hmm. for us? Yes. Okay. That brings up so much emotion in me. Just the... Because I, be I believe you. I really believe you. It more and more feels to me that it's... It's actually the nature of things, like not that is the distortion. Mm. 
I, I said recently something like, living an enchanted life is our birthright and that's really a synonym for what we're talking about here to live in that full knowledge full acceptance full expression of our divinity and our human not needing to close off dismiss bypass either feels more and more clearly to me why we're here Yes, we are here to have a human experience in a way that we couldn't if we weren't here having a human experience, but we're not meant to do it with a complete, a complete, it's more than a forgetting. It's almost like <clears throat> the way we're raised in this modern culture it is like a severance from that deeper, truer divine aspect of ourselves. And it's not how it's meant to be. That's the distortion. Yeah, that that word came to me as um, just before you said it, that it does feel like, it, um, yeah, it's been severed. Um, not for everybody on this earth, earthly plane, though, thank goodness. And mm. what I'm hearing in and what I know of Waking the Wild is about how even in this modern culture we can not live in the same way as um indigenous uh, people do you know but we can live in this modern culture but still have access to yeah our birthright so i'm curious How, yeah, how, how we even, you've said that basically love is the answer. Love is the answer to this. So could you share a little bit more about what that looks like in our modern culture? Mm. And the, um, the quote that you'll be very familiar with um, that just came to mind is the Alistair Crowley quote, love is the law, love under will. Love is the law, love under will. and I've contemplated, meditated on, spoken about, answered questions on those seven words. I've got it on my, uh, <laughs> my board there. <laughs> those seven words uh, for so long because there's so much in them. And the, the love that's spoken about in that quote is the same love we're talking about here. And... The reason that's come to mind is it brings in something that I think is so often missing when when we have the experience of some kind of spiritual path, some kind of ascension path where we get a taste of our our divinity, where we get the experience that like maybe there is something beyond us and we go up and out of the human to the point where the human isn't even important, it's dismissed, it's almost like it was an accident. Like all we need to do is try and return back there as quickly as we possibly can. Um, and actually have the kind of the severance happen the other way around where we sever ourselves from the human to go upwards before we're ready to do that because we're actually still meant to be here being human. And the again the beauty the power of those words is that it's what it's speaking to in the word will is that that fast that that perfect diamond that star that each of us came here to be that because of our disconnection because of our conditioning is told that it's like there's going to be parts of that that aren't going to be okay they're gonna really rub up against all the things that we're told aren't good enough, aren't, don't fit the mold, aren't safe, are something to be ashamed of. And so whilst we, if we call, whether we could say, let's, let's for the moment, instead of the use of the word will, let's, let's say true self. If there's aspects of our true self, and there will be, <laughs> that aren't acceptable culturally, or we've been shown are gonna have us be hurt and rejected, 
we aren't going to be them. We are going to stay frozen in a state that we've molded ourselves to that is denying aspects of that true self so that we can get by, so we can survive. Therefore, going back to your question, you know, how does this, how do we have this experience of our divinity? It's recognizing that like within that seed of the, like the, the, the will itself, the, the true self itself is a direct expression of the divine. It just happens to be one that we have the experience to live from, create from here in this realm. And so the more we can recognize that is the way that we get to have this experience as a god or a goddess walking on this plane is to be that full expression of the star, of the divine spark. That is where we live from. But love is required in order for us to be able to do that. If we are still in shaming and fearing those parts of ourselves that we've been shown aren't safe, we won't be able to do it. The only way is to be able to bring love to those parts of ourselves. And again, all reflected in others that we're currently repulsed by, scared by. So that's why it's so needed that we recognize we're here as this unique divine expression. And that in itself is an expression of love and love is needed to become it. Okay. So if we manage <laughs> to, to do that, we brought love to the parts of us that we've um, hidden away through conditioning um, and the st st old stories. So we're now able to yeah, own our our gifts, be uh, our true self. What's what's next? Because we're going to be so that so we've got that, but then I step out into the world. Into well, thankfully, my place of work is working with <laughs> working <laughs> with other <laughs> gods and goddesses. So <laughs> maybe <clears throat> I'm not the best example, but for many people. They're stepping into places where that's not what what everyone else has all you know has has done. They haven't. Mm. They're still walking around hiding their true mm. self because that's what it, yeah to them is what's going to help them to survive. So how does that work? Mm. Um, earlier, you asked something else that that put in mind something that actually feels as though it's the answer to to this question, and it is that that distortion within ourselves, that dis disconnection in ourselves, has been is designed to do the dance of disconnection. It's designed to do the dance of conditions. It works from that place. The dance only works when we have that in place where we've got self and others operating within the dance of disconnection, where we're looking for someone to <clears throat> make us feel loved, make us feel safe. And everything works. I mean, it, it doesn't feel great, but it works. Everyone knows the steps in that dance. As we start to, and of course, you know, this, the work we're talking about here can take most of a lifetime. So it's not like we're going to be like fully in the dance of being gods and goddesses. Like anytime soon, it's likely to be a bit of a kind of like in that dance, not in that dance, but more and more. As we move into that dance, we recognize again that love isn't something that is kind of like turn onable and offable. It's not conditional. It's not something that we need from others in order to make us feel safe. It's an experience that we're in. It's an experience that we are bathing in. And when we 
when we're experiencing something out there that's not that, it's no longer experienced as a threat in here, which is ultimately what's happening. When, when we're, we're still in that dance of disconnection, we experience things out there that are kind of seeming to be like drawing away, not giving us what we need to feel safe, we it, it's the parts of us that are disconnected that are responding to that and saying this isn't safe this isn't safe i need someone to behave this way for me to feel safe when when that is no longer our experience because we know we're whole we know we're safe we know that we're loved what we then experience when it's happening out there is completely different and typically the what we we are able to um it's not even bring whatever however i name this it's going to sound a little bit like a, a kind of steps or transactional and it's not really I'm, I'm i'm not sure i can quite name this in a way that really does justice to it but it it, it goes back i guess to what i was saying right at the beginning the kind of love that we're talking about is fully accepting all things including disconnection including fear, including anger, including anger directed at us, including repulsion directed at us. It doesn't, it doesn't suddenly become, oh, this isn't lovable. It's another thing to love. It's how life is showing up right now. which brings to mind something that I know you, you've witnessed a number of times now when we've been in circle together, where you've seen people verbally expressing anger towards me, where I've said something, done something that's provoked them into anger. And more and more, I recognize that there was a time maybe a, a few years back where when that would happen, I would notice there were still parts of me that were responding with fear, feeling this sense of threat, like, you know, anger particularly is a, you know, big, scary emotion it's meant to be. And there were parts of me that were responding to it where I was almost having to like tend to those parts of me that were still going, Eek, this isn't safe, this isn't safe. And then there was a, a growing part of me. It's like, it's okay, I can hold you, this scared part of me, and I can hold them. And it was like a kind of negotiation that was needing to happen in order to stay open and loving and present for that person. Over the last couple of years, I notice that that part of me doesn't seem to be there with a voice anymore. It doesn't seem it's, it's been integrated into the system. And now when that happens, the experience here is, is love. It's that's what's, you know, what's happening there in terms of their expression and me meeting it is an example of what we were saying right at the beginning this is how love liberates this is how love heals this is how love generates this is how love creates there is something new being created in that moment as love meets fear and love can't be scared of fear because otherwise it wouldn't be love yeah yeah so any response other than love is is not is is not love <laughs> yeah <laughs> <laughs> yeah i was visualizing uh somebody like right in front of your face like screaming in your face and and you yeah being see, seeing the love in them seeing them for who they truly are and not needing yeah to defend yourself or anything like that there was just it was just like this this radiation of love so no matter what they were bringing it was just then met with love and alchemized so yeah, that completely answers my question 
about yeah you know, how would we take this how would you know in into into work yes when you are unconditional love there is nothing there's nothing to fear and not in a as you mentioned earlier a bypassing way it it, it then because that's that's the reality that's that's what's real and true mm. you you're not pretending anything and that feels very different to the type of love that gets um often spoken about this gentle soft i mean that is that's full on power <laughs> that's strength isn't it right there that Mm. <clears throat> it's funny you said strength. Do you remember just before we started recording, we we're talking about the <clears throat> lust card in the Soth deck, which is the equivalent of strength in other decks. And yeah, more and more, it feels to me that power is synonymous with love. Um, and again, it's because we've we've got these like just slivers of love. We don't see that. We think it's like this when it's really this <laughs> um <clears throat> something else you just said that um really more and more is my experience and you know I have moments too where um there's still parts of me that are fear that I are still still requiring tending you know it's not that I'm here all of the time but it's most of the time now that, that's what I can say and from from that space space doesn't isn't really from that experience from knowing knowing really who we really are <clears throat> it's so much it's so clear that when we're not that it is those little children parts of us that are hurting are scared and that then becomes so visible. It's so visible that when that's where someone's reacting from, it, it, it's just like undeniable. It's this little girl, little boy. And how would anything other than love make sense? Yeah. Yeah. You just... Yeah, nothing else would make sense to respond to a child that's sad, angry, whatever the emotion is in front of you. The res the response is love. It has to be. And if it isn't, it's because of that part in us that's scared. So two children. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Two children. And that, and that really brings me back to the experience I had in the grave. I love just throwing in that low. <laughs> <laughs> um, which really was the way that, like, we are all children in the eyes of, let's for the moment say, Mother Earth. I could use many words for this, but I'm just going to say Mother Earth because that was the experience I had then. We are all her children. And we, we sometimes feel so ashamed, so unlovable. And again, we've almost like taught ourselves to experience ourselves that way to feel safe. It's like we can't dare approve of those parts of ourselves that would have ourselves rejected by others. Therefore, going back to what you said earlier, it's like dangerous to have to experience unconditional love because then what if we ended up showing those parts of ourselves to the world and then we'd be rejected in or hurt and so the the thing that I just was so so made it's not even aware of because it was just there it was just the experience was the way that that's how we're seen we're all seen as innocent beautiful pure children that we don't need to do anything we don't need to be less of something 
we don't need to be this like you know perfect or better version in order to have that love because it's just there it's just there mm. what i'm seeing in in that is that that means that we can bring all expression it's all welcome and i know that's something that you repeatedly say <laughs> <laughs> in circles in uh in groups you know you repeatedly say all of you is welcome and that's what i'm hearing in that in that that um we can express everything that's there to be expressed nothing is off the table nothing is off limits and when you have that level of freedom of expression again that is how can that be anything but love mm, yes that's that's again when we look at love as this the power the generative power it is when we're expressing we're loving we're an expression of love um it's 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 so simple that it it sounds like a cliche it sounds like it, it's too good to be true in fact funny enough uh a client said that to me yesterday she was saying how <sighs> there was part of her as I was talking about something not dissimilar to what we're talking about here she was like this part of her that was saying this feels too good to be true and she said there's another part of me that believes you and knows this is also here for me and she was recollecting a year earlier where there were things I was saying then that sounded too good to be true that now are true for her and you know anything that I'm saying here may sound pie in the sky might might sound too good to be true or only for some people that's also what she's saying she goes maybe that's true for you Leanne but maybe not for me but there was this sense in her but maybe it is maybe it is because I think really we know you know that that part of us that came here to have that fully divine fully human experience here's this knows it to be our truth it's I was just remembering again something that I was, I was really recognizing was coming up, up in me at the weekend, which is not a typical experience for me. This it really stood out that it was like there was this like complete love available to me. And then I had this part of me that was like, do I deserve this? Have I really been good enough to deserve this? Like, why would I be that lucky? that fortunate that I get this when <clears throat> I'm not, I'm, you know, I'm not completely pure and other people don't get to have this. Like, why me? Why me? And it was just like over and over again, I was shown that it's like, no, all of this is included. There's nowhere you need to, to move to in order to be any more worthy of this than you are right now. It's only you closing to it. It's here. You can choose to close and not receive it, but there's no need to. It's here for you right now. What's coming up for me is another Crowley quote that you recently shared and that it for some reason that feels like it ties in with this and us knowing I suppose uh, what the what the what the journey is um I don't know if you will you have it to hand have you got it to <laughs> was it the one uh the one about um da -da 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 about the taboos what's coming complexes to me, yeah because yeah. what's coming to me yeah it's about everything being welcome and so therefore when things then aren't there's no need for the distortion there's no need for mm. uh yeah so uh, yeah so that's why that quote then suddenly came into view for me so oh yes yeah in there I love that. Yeah. So let me read it. That really makes sense because it that that is the liberation. 
Yes. It's like we no longer have to be this shaped when we know it's okay to be the shape we actually came here for. Um, the will must be freed of its fetters. The ruthless examination and destruction of taboos, complex, frustrations, dislikes, fears, dis and disgusts hostile to the will is essential to progress. And that's that the like I love those words freed of its fetters because it's like it, it's there's nothing can actually distort or damage or deny the purity of will of our soul of like it's there nothing can happen to it but we cover it over push it down with all of that stuff that he was talking about all those complexes dislikes all of that covers it up as we do the work to recognize there's nothing wrong with who we are like at the deepest level like it is perfect that that impulse in us that deepest generative impulse is freed of its fetters and we can live as it and it being love it is it is and that's what i guess the going back again to the uh love is the law on love under will the paradox in that is will itself is love but you know the whole thing wouldn't make sense if it was just love 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 but like really that's <laughs> what it is like will itself is an expression of love <laughs> what would the quote be love under love love under love <laughs> and it's just like that that would take a lifetime to meditate on that. <laughs> um but I th actually do think this raises something that I think is so so helpful to recognize and is freeing this in itself I think is so freeing to know is that because will is an expression of love is made of love it's it's a unique expression of love that we came here to be it is for the highest good. If we are to live our will, it inherently is generative. It's in inherently going to have an expansive, creative, beautifying impact. We can trust that. We can trust that. And so part of what gets in the way of us being able to live our will is we don't trust it we think oh it's going to be damaging it's going to hurt others it's going to be me needing to be selfish and yes you know there's times where us living our will can look selfish we could be accused of being selfish um but the more time i've spent with this and again with myself and also others the more i can see the truth is the the only things that are seemingly destroyed seemingly uh negatively impacted by someone living their will are things that weren't meant to be things that aren't true things that were created by fear things that were built from distortion Yes, that makes sense. Yeah, because you do you hear um, people say, well, yeah, but people might say, well, that was my will. That's what I want. That's what I wanted to do. And it's, it's, I suppose, nuance, if that's the right uh, word for it. Um, yeah, could easily hide behind this idea of will. But like you say, if will is love, then does change things somewhat <laughs> mm. it's always for the highest good it may not be obvious how it is it may look like it's not but it is if it's will it is for the highest good we're right up on time for this show uh, so i'd just like to just to see if there was a, a question that I didn't ask you that you're like, oh, Sarah, why haven't you, why haven't you asked me this? This is what I wanted to say about love. Is there anything else 
that you'd like to share now? I mean, obviously, we could do many, many, a whole series of shows <laughs> on the topic of love. But how would you like to end this particular show? What, um, what's occurring to me is, is linked to what we were just talking about, but it's the permission that love brings. And I see this very, very clearly in the work I do with others. And any clients and students listening to this will probably chuckle or <laughs> or grind their teeth as, as I as I say this. In the because I know that if I'm going to reflect something, guide someone on something, um I know that it, I'm only doing so as love. There's, I've got no desire to do it from any other place. And if there's if there's any part of me that is like, hmm, is there some of my own stuff in this? I would always pause and do my work on that first. It's fairly rare that I have a sense that there might be some of my own stuff. When I say my own stuff, like my own fear, really. Um, and even if I suspect, you know, like if something is getting quite dicey and I think there, there could be some of my stuff, that's when I'll go to Jonathan or someone else I trust and say, you know, can you check my feet on this? I just want to be sure that I'm clean on this. Um, mostly I don't need to. Mostly I know that what's coming through me is, is from love. And it's not always pretty. It, it has me do and say things and this comes back to the way that you know I do anger people like love can be the most provocative destructive dissolving chaos making agent on earth and so some sometimes it really is not something that looks or feels good in the moment there's times where in fact I think it was was it last week where you did a video testimonial with a client that said like Leanne's just really triggered me and it was you know because I said I can't really remember what it was but she was she was saying something or other that she was going to do with a client and I think I was saying like no that's from shadow and I have a lot of leeway, a lot of permission to speak truth, truth that may not be welcome, truth that might well hurt, truth that will stop someone in their tracks, truth that may well trigger shame and fear, because that's what's needed for the healing. And it is love that allows me to do that and for it to be healing and liberating and generative. Yeah, I'm glad that you brought that piece in. And what I will say, because I have been on the receiving end of the <laughs> of that provocation and your level of love, is that it ne I'm never in fear. And that's what I would say is a, a huge, yeah, a hu huge. Yes, I might feel um shame frustration things like that but i'm never in fear i always know that what you're offering is unconditional love and i love you so much for that so yeah you're <laughs> you're such a gift and the fact that you're leading the way showing the way guiding the way that this is, is you know this is for all of us who are that have feel the call to this you know this this work this soul work this path isn't for everybody but if mm. you feel the call then oh my goodness um take it take the step take the next step and as i've just said take the next step Leah, what would the next step be for somebody who's listening to this and something has resonated they're feeling a, a pull a draw to know more what is the next step? Mm. It's our intention very much is to 
provide those next breadcrumbs, provide those steps. I was kind of just over visiting a forest, you know, wild forest like that. That first step into the forest is very much our intention. And in, you know, we're recording this literally just before we rebirth into Wake in the Wild and we'll start to provide that next step. But what we're talking about here is so much beyond me personally, so much beyond Wake in the Wild as an organization. This again is ultimately the path back to ourselves, a path back to our birthright, the path back to our wild souls. And that first step is going to look quite different for each of us. That's the thing I do know. And it, it sounds too simple to, to be something that actually works, but it does. It's the simplest, but also the most powerful thing I know is to allow yourself to, one way or another, be in a wild environment. Whether that's a sit spot, whether that's creating a connection with a special tree, that I mean, you've you've anyone who's listened to this show before, and you certainly saw or will know the. For me, my relationship with my tree has been one of the single most most profound. Um, tangible representation of the kind of love that we're talking about here that I've experienced even now and it's it right from the beginning of that connection it, it showed me what was possible and then showed me what's next showed me what was next there's there's no way I would be doing any of what I'm doing now if it wasn't for that tree so there's obviously so many ways we can go deeper and deeper and deeper but it really is that simple to come back to the habitat we were actually designed for again we're talking about this way of living fully divine fully human is our birthright that birthright was meant to happen in the wild is what our dna was created for to be in that kind of environment and something happens at a dna level at a magical level something happens something is alchemized through that love that we experience when we allow ourselves again even these just like little droplets of being back in that connection that we came here for Beautiful. Thank you, Leanne. I think we did it, Sarah. <laughs> <laughs> we surely did. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you so much.